Seances, where the world of the living reaches out to the world of the dead. Seances are often seen as the stuff of nightmares, yet millions of ordinary people have gone to them to talk to those who have died. They go to make contact with their loved ones, to satisfy themselves that there is life after death, and to see for themselves the power of the spirit world. The spirits of the dead come to seances through mediums who, like radio receivers, tune into invisible messages. Mental mediums hear the dead talking inside their heads. Physical mediums feel them take over their bodies. Unpredictable things can happen at a seance, from icy breezes to disembodied voices, and even most terrifying of all, a materialized visitor from beyond the grave. Amy! Amy! Spirits are unpredictable forces. And those who venture into the spirit world must be prepared for the consequences. The George pub in Lancashire, Northern England, seemed no different from any other pub when Tom Harrison his wife Anne arrived as its new owners. But then the noises started, scrapings and bangings, and figures began to flash from room to room. Down in the cellar, Tom discovered something even more unnerving, a man digging, seemingly unaware of Tom's presence, who then dissolved to nothing. The next night, Tom awoke to a chill breeze, and in the mirror was the figure from the cellar, standing there in the clothes of a Quaker. I am Robert Clay. One of the regulars in the pub knew of a medium who had experience of unexplained hauntings. The medium was asked not to be identified, came that very afternoon. Her diagnosis was eerily accurate. By the time she'd been here 10 minutes, I thought, you must know something to be able to be telling us what you are telling us, because she was telling us things that she couldn't possibly have known, because there were things that had happened to Tom, and he'd only relayed them to me, and I didn't believe him anyway. I thought he'd just been drinking too much, to be honest. The medium confirmed what Tom had feared. She said there is a, a very, very bad presence here. She's not strong enough to handle um, this bad presence. And she will have to go and get some of her friends to come and help her. What the medium proposed was a seance that very night. The only way to stop the haunting was to summon this evil presence and confront it. The medium returned with two colleagues, a woman and a much younger man who was still a novice. Tom and Anne were told to sit across the table and Tom was given precise instructions. She said, what we want you to do is to sit there with your back against the wall and hold yourself to the back of the wall because he may try and enter you. Two of the mediums went into a trance and almost at once began to talk, but their voices were not their own. The spirits of two little girls had taken over the bodies of the mediums and were speaking through them. Very frightened, they sounded very frightened. They wanted to make things right somehow. That's how they were coming across. Spirits told how, more than 200 years before, Robert Clay had murdered them and buried their bodies in the cellar of the jaw. 
Now they knew what had given rise to the hauntings at the George, but they still had to deal with the dangerous spirit of Robert Clay himself. They needed to persuade him to move safely on into the afterlife. Suddenly, the young novice started to tremble. The malign spirit of Robert Clay was starting to take over his body. The group braced itself to withstand every medium's nightmare. Fortunately, not all seances are as searing as this one at the George pub. Most are more everyday events, attended by thousands of people each week in the Western world alone. Like millions of others around the world, medium Suzanne Northrop is convinced that death is not the end. What I believe happens when we die is basically this. I believe we are more than a body call it consciousness, call it soul. I, I think it's basically the same thing. We exist within a body, we exist when we leave the body. That continued consciousness, that soul moves on. When we physically die, our soul, our consciousness moves on. Linda Williamson, a British medium, has no doubt that the essence of personality continues after death. When we die, we simply leave the physical body behind as if we were leaving behind an old overcoat we have no use for and we pass into the next dimension of life so that people who die are in fact basically the same people the personality is still the same but these personalities exist in a different dimension not accessible to most of our everyday lives one way to overcome the barrier is by attending a seance a gathering of people who talk to the dead. Every seance requires a medium, a person who links the sitters with the world of the spirits. Basically, a medium is a person who acts as a between this level of life and the next, and a medium will try to attune her mind to the next dimension of life to link in and to communicate with the people who have just left this world and gone into the next world. And the whole idea is to give evidence that life does go on after death and to give comfort to people who are mourning. Mediums have a special ability to communicate with the spirit world, moving in or out of it at will. People ask whether I'm seeing and hearing spirits all the time. I'm certainly not doing that. Communication takes place when I want it to. For some mediums, Communication is completely separated from normal consciousness. I am generally what I call in some kind of an altered state, although I've learned to function in this state very well because I'm in and out of it all the time. Once I leave or I am done with the session, I will have no recall of it. I might remember the bits and pieces of, we'll say, the person's name or, or something in that sense, but actually information that was identified or given during that time I will not have any recall of. People are often driven to seances by grief. They desperately want contact with loved ones who have died. Others are prompted by a curiosity. They want personal proof of what happens when life on this earth has ended. I think it makes sense to try to find out what happens afterwards, if there is another life, what sort of life it is. There is a great deal of evidence for survival or post-mortem survival. If anybody wants to look into it, the evidence is there for them already. The evidence for most people comes during seances. They don't have to be scary nighttime sessions of popular imagination with dim rooms and ghostly knockings. A seance or sitting can be held anywhere, anytime. Well, when people come for a sitting, they have all sorts of strange ideas. They think the room is going to be in darkness. They think they're going to see spirits floating around. There's a lot of fear. In fact, there really is nothing to be afraid of. If you go for a sitting with a medium, the room will just be an ordinary daylight. And all the medium will do is sit and talk to you. Seances don't have to be held close to where the dead person lived or indeed died. The only exception is when the seance, like that at the George pub, is held to reach a troublesome spirit trapped in a particular place. Modern seances are usually held in people's homes. They tend to be informal affairs, but that doesn't mean that they're uneventful. 
Tom Harrison sat in some of the most famous seances of this century with his medium mother, Minnie. A home circle of any kind is as natural as sitting around the fire chatting. And all the visitors we had all said the same thing. They felt at first, oh, it's going to be a bit spooky, a bit frightening. Uh, no. I must say the first time that Aunt Ag materialized, right in the middle of the room, quite unexpectedly, and turned to me and put her arms out to me and had four carnations in her materialized hand, I was a bit dry in the mouth, sitting gawping, I think. Gobsmacked is today's phrase. Not frightened, but just amazed. They don't frighten you because you have that loving atmosphere within the room. Suzanne Northrup's seances are as far away from the usual stereotype as you can get. She holds them in shopping malls and restaurants, and broadcasts them on the radio. By 8 19, 19 minutes after 8, and world famous psychic Suzanne Northrup live with us at Churchill's in Holtzville. What happens when I work with audiences on the radio is basically this. I will walk around the room, and as I walk around the room, I will hear sounds. Uh, generally, it's a name. Cheryl. Oh, you're Cheryl. Cheryl. I'm really glad when you people remember your names. My God. <laughs> Dead people will know you by your name, won't they? Okay. <laughs> The reason for my work is for somebody to make contact with a loved one that has passed over. And I want to tell you, there's one other thing here that he comes through. Um, he was having, from what he's showing me, a lot of difficulty with his eyes, and particularly the... And I want to say, I don't know if he could... Oh, my dad was legally blind. Oh, legally blind. All right, thank you. Oh, Wonderful. Gosh. Well, we see well now. That's what I wanted to That's know. That's what you wanted to know. Okay. Even more unconventional are some of the seances conducted by Ed and Lorraine Warren. They are rescue mediums. They're called in when paranormal activity is causing problems, and their job is to contact and deal with troublesome spirits. If you could, for a, mag a minute, imagine, and I know you can't, especially a woman, a monster entering their home, physically beating them, sodomizing them, raping them for hours, you have a slight idea of an incubus attack. Incubus attacks, succubus are the worst. The succubus attacks the male, the incubus, the female. A 13-year-old girl, which was brought here, opened up the doors to an incubus attack by using a Ouija board, which is just a game. But it's a game that can be quite dangerous. And right out there in the building on my property, as the priest and the parents watched, We've seen that girl levitate a few inches into the air. The hair was torn out of her scalp. Teeth marks appeared all over her arms and legs with saliva on them. And this girl would scream and yell that in bed when she was being attacked uh, physically and sexually. Modern seances are certainly varied, but they are not an ancient tradition. The belief in life after death goes back to the earliest civilizations. But it was only relatively recently, in the last 150 years, that it has become fashionable to speak with the dead. In Western history, ghosts have confirmed to many of us that some part, at least, of the human spirit continues after death. But ghosts have always appeared when they wanted to, and they don't usually encourage conversation. The idea that we could communicate with the dead whenever we wanted to, and that they could talk back, was a breakthrough. It came about in 1848, when children in the Fox family in Hydesville, New York, began to be disturbed by strange noises. There were two daughters, and they complained that they were hearing noises, bangs, raps, and their parents were so worried that they brought in the neighbors. And then someone among the neighbors hit on the idea of achieving a code by one rap and two rap. The answers told them that the sounds were coming from the spirit of a peddler, murdered and hidden away without proper burial. Excavations in the cellar unearthed a peddler's tin. Still later, building works revealed the skeleton of a man buried beneath the walls of the house. The messages seemed to have spelled out the truth.
As they grew into their teens, the girls began to hold regular seances, and the raps and messages moved on from the peddler to other spirits. The girls became famous and went on the road to give public seances, which featured moving objects, rocking furniture, and more messages. They were greeted with enthusiasm, but skeptics accused them of producing the noises themselves, possibly with their knees and toe joints. Investigators could find no evidence of fraud. The audiences were so convinced. By the 1850s, hundreds of thousands of East Coast Americans had become spiritualists, a general term for those who went to seances to contact the dead. Spiritualism even reached the White House, where Abraham Lincoln began to hold seances after the death of his son, Michael. In 1862, while trying to contact Contact his child, Lincoln sat with the medium Nettie Colburn. In a deep trance, she delivered a lecture on the evils of slavery. Lincoln had already announced his intention to abolish slavery, but within a few weeks of the seance, he had issued the final Emancipation Declaration. Across the Atlantic, too, seances were becoming commonplace. Queen Victoria was grieving for her dead husband, Albert, when she heard that a 13-year-old medium was receiving messages addressed to her. The boy, Robert James Lees, was then summoned to a seance with the Queen, and Victoria became reunited with the spirit of Albert. During his stay at Balmoral, Victoria's Scottish home, Lees discovered that John Brown, one of Victoria's estate workers, had the gift of mediumship. Brown took Lees's place at the regular royal seances. Their lengthy sessions continued for many years, leading to speculation that Brown's role was not confined to contacting the dead. The war that brought death into every family in Europe introduced millions more to the idea of spiritualism. Among the bereaved of World War I, there was a tremendous hunger for spiritual comfort and a desperate need for reassurance that the dead were, in some way, still there. Not everyone approved of the notion of talking to the dead. Scientists became interested in the truth of the spiritualist claims, and many became psychical researchers. Some, like Professor Sir Oliver Lodge, began as skeptics but became believers. Oliver was a great physicist and pioneer of radio and curious about the idea of mediumship. When his son Raymond was killed in the First World War, he decided to test spiritualism for himself. During seances, he received a number of answers to his questions. One reply won considerable publicity. When Sir Oliver asked his son what had happened after he died. Raymond if it was Raymond, said, I poured myself a stiff whiskey and soda. And this turned a lot of people off. Whiskies and sodas on the other side, that's not the kind of spirits we want. Yet Sir Oliver's honesty shone through the ridicule, and his book, Raymond, became a great source of comfort to other bereaved parents. Between the wars, the popularity of seances continued to grow, even if for some it was a little more than a fashionable entertainment. I was only saying that the other evening to Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens? Oh, my dear, I'm attending seances with the most marvellous medium, the most famous medium in the world. And Mr. Vincent, oh, you must have heard of him. And through him the other night, Charles Dickens spoke to us. By the time the Second World War had started harvesting its victims, spiritualism was respectable enough to have its own column in the British press. In one such seance report, incredulous admiralty officials read of messages from sailors drowned in the sinking of their ship, HMS Barham. The Barham had indeed sunk with great loss of life, but it was classified information until the seance preempted the official announcement. The messages had been received in England by Helen Duncan, one of the most famous wartime mediums. 
The Admiralty was convinced that Mrs. Duncan was a spy, but didn't see how she could be getting her facts. Eventually, frustrated officials imprisoned her under an ancient witchcraft act. Jim Macquarie, himself a medium, considers Helen to be a heroine of the spiritualist movement. The witchcraft act was repealed because of Mrs. Duncan. It's now firmly believed that the case in London was brought about because Mrs. Duncan was busy bringing back people who hadn't been notified as being dead, and the, the government were planning the D-Day landings, and they didn't want her picking up on those plans. That is what is widely believed now. Um, there was a notion that she was a spy, but how ridiculous. A working-class woman from a working-class area of Edinburgh, um, it just doesn't make sense at all. It's just rubbish. With the repeal of the Witchcraft Act, spiritualism was free to establish itself as a legal and recognized religion. The spiritualist church, whose ministers are mediums. The first universal spiritualist church of New York was founded in 1948. The Reverend Daniel Newsom is its pastor. This church basically came from the spiritualist tradition where people basically came to hear messages from their uh, relatives or friends who have passed on. And there were a lot of predictions about the future and that kind of thing. But, and we have a message service in which I will have like four mediums uh, give messages to the congregation that lasts about two or three minutes each. What you're dreaming of? The spiritualist church provides an umbrella for many mediums, but others prefer to hold small, regular seances in their own homes. These home circles are perhaps the most important way in which mediums meet, develop, and work. Being able to communicate with spirits is an extraordinary gift, and mediums experience it very differently. They broadly divide themselves into two categories, those who produce physical manifestations of their contact with the other side, and those whose communication is strictly mental. What I do, what nearly all mediums do now, is what is called mental mediumship. That is to say, the medium attunes her mind to those who are communicating, and she will pass on whatever she is sensing or hearing or seeing. But the person who is with the medium, the sitter, will not actually see or hear anything themselves. That is the main difference. Some mediums actually hear the voices of the spirits inside their heads. They're known as clairaudience. What I personally rely upon is what I hear. I'm not here with my physical ears, but I'm hearing the voices in my mind, but it is a definite voice rather than just the thought impression. Other mental mediums are clairvoyant, that's to say they see their messages as images. Lorraine Warren operates in this way, and as she's often called in to deal with unquiet spirits, she sees some harrowing cases. Occasion to help whose house is haunted by what they believe to be the spirit of a murdered girl. I went right into a trance state, and I began to see the area as it doesn't look right now. I could see a young girl, and she came walking towards this building, this house. At this point, in a porch, and I smell whiskey, so strong I can smell whiskey. Then the girl continues to walk, avoiding this porch where there were men that had been drinking. And I say, I see a hatchway. Where's the hatchway? And they said, there is no hatchway. There was a hatchway there. It's now been changed. Lorraine was seeing a replay of the rape and murder which had taken place in the house. Her aim had been to discover what had happened and then persuade the spirit of the girl that it was time to move on. But as the scene neared its climax... It's horrible. Right at that point, I said, I can't go on. I said, I don't want to really see this. Nor did the spirit seem like it wanted to relive it. Some mediums first become aware of their abilities at times of deep emotional trauma. 
Doris Stokes, world famous during the 60s for her consistently accurate seances, didn't realize she had this talent until as a young wartime bride, she received the dreaded telegram reporting her husband killed in action. Then she heard the voice of her dead father saying that her husband was alive. On Christmas Day, another telegram arrived to say that her husband was alive and well. Doris realized that she had a special gift and went on to become a professional medium, bringing comfort to thousands of people around the world. Most mediums decide to share their gift with others, although it isn't the most conventional of careers. This is one of those professions that I'm sure no one thinks about they're going to grow up and do it for a living. It's not like I'm going to grow up and you know be a telephone operator or I'm going to grow up and uh, be an actress. One does not think about growing up and talking to the other world or what I call the dead. I think when people tend to do this for a living, it means that they've probably had some experience in their life, at least in my experience. But being a successful medium isn't just a case of natural natural talent. Mediums can develop their skills. Some people are born with a very strong natural ability. Even as children, they are able to see and hear spirit people. Of course, for them, it's much easier. A lot of people are born, as I was, with a slight sensitivity as children, not actually seeing or hearing anything clearly, but just sensing that people are there. I think it's rather like any art, shall we say, the ability to be a fine singer. Some people are born with a naturally beautiful singing voice. Other people are born with a certain ability to sing, and they can be trained to do it better. Others are just tone deaf, can never do it at all. Many mediums work in an altered state of consciousness, which can vary from focused concentration to a deep trance in which the medium becomes unaware of the surroundings. What will happen is I will actually feel almost a consciousness where you feel like you're going to fall asleep. And then I actually feel something, a, a, a spiritual presence just comes over me. Then I kind of just go into the flow and the, the guide just expresses itself directly through me. And I'm not actually hearing it and then saying it, it just comes through me. Mediums learn to control these states as part of their training. Right now, it's not hard to go into trance, but this is after doing it for 10 years. And basically the exercise is you stare into a candle and you just count yourself down, I guess it was 10 or 11 stairs. And I worked with that exercise and that's how I learned how to go into trance. Regulating contact with the spirits is likened by many mediums to a more mundane form of communication. I think the radio is quite a good analogy to describe communication. We know that television and radio waves are in the air all the time. They come within our own homes, but we're not normally aware of them, not unless we turn on the set and tune into the station. And it's rather like that with mediumship. The spirit world, at least that part of the spirit world to which we pass when we first die, is around us all the time on this other dimension. Many mediums have spirit contacts in the other world to help them organize their communication. For the medium, they are as real as friends in life. I'm aware of a group of people around me that I would call guides or helpers, not necessarily one individual, but I've learned to trust those people over the years that I've been doing it. And I know that if I could tune in clearly to them, then what they give me will be right. Suzanne's helper, Elizabeth, organizes the communicators and protects Suzanne. Elizabeth's function on the other side in what I call a crowd control purpose, meaning she organizes people to sort of back off until the other ones have come through. The work of mental mediums presents a constant challenge to the scientific world. As far as the mediums are concerned, it's simple. They're talking to the dead. But scientists seek another explanation. The more spectacular the medium, the more likely they are to attract investigators. Possibly the most marvelous and most closely medium 
was Mrs. Leonora Piper, who lived in the United States, but who visited Europe. She was researched, studied by eminent psychical researchers who were forced to come to the conclusion that she had the most marvelous psychic talent. Leonora's speciality lay in delivering messages about obscure, unrecorded events, childhood secrets, long ago Christmases and intimate conversations. received a message from his dead mother. It included the inscription inside a ring she gave him as a boy. The inscription had been their secret and the ring had been lost for years. Even private detectives could find no evidence of fraud against Mrs. Piper. In general, scientific investigators have made little progress unraveling the mystery of mediumship. It may not be possible to really test scientifically whether or not anyone can communicate with the deceased. The reason is ESP. Let's say you go into a trance or contact a medium, and the medium talks to dead Aunt Charlotte. And Aunt Charlotte tells you things that are remarkable. Not just, I always loved you, right? But rather, the missing car keys are under the cab, and you go there, and there they are. Now, is that evidence that dead Aunt Charlotte was contacted? The answer is maybe, maybe not, because what's possible is the medium who has contacted Aunt Charlotte for you has used her ESP un unconsciously. People do sometimes think that it's all down to telepathy, but in fact, when a medium can give you a piece of information that is not even in your mind, then you know that telepathy is not the explanation. There are many cases where the medium's information is unknown to both medium and sitters. The phenomenon of drop-in communicators is one documented example. During the last war, there were times when the spirits of dead servicemen coming through to seances were unknown to anyone in the circle. They were regarded as a bit of a nuisance, but some circles recorded the names and details of these uninvited guests. Years later, the records were followed up and the details found to be accurate. The names corresponded responding to soldiers who had died at about the time of their appearance in the seances. Most scientists are at a loss to explain how it could be possible to communicate with the dead, but parapsychologists have some theories. There is some connection between ESP, parapsychology, and life after death and mediumship. If we really do have this ability to say, for example, psychokinesis, to cause things to move without any intermediary force between them. Um, if we have the ability, in a sense, to go beyond our bodies, to somehow gain knowledge around us without the use of our senses, then it strongly suggests there's some non-physical aspect to us. Now, if there's a non-physical aspect to us, then at the death of the body, that non-physical part may continue to exist. Those who have experienced successful mental mediumship for themselves, either as sitters or mediums, need no further proof that extraordinary things happen. But mental mediumship is by no means the most dramatic phenomenon that seances can produce. In the seances of physical mediums, events can be startling. The experience of mediumship enters a different dimension with physical mediums. While the dead speak through mental mediums, they act through physical mediums, even taking over their bodies. Sitters may have the unnerving experience of hearing the voice of their loved one from the mouth of the medium, who is usually in a deep trance. This phenomenon causes much amazement and has often been portrayed in popular films. Laurie. Don't be unhappy, because I'm not. I'm happy, even though you're not here. For some mediums, the spirit energy takes over their entire body. Mediums have been known to grow or shrink by several inches during a seance, and occasionally to overcome the laws of gravity. Daniel Dunglass Hume was an Englishman 
who during the 19th century astonished sitters by levitating into the air in broad daylight. Although closely observed, he was never found guilty of trickery. And in many cases, he would be taken to a house he had never been in. He would be watched all the time. And yet, people of enormous reputation, with no axe to grind, would say that they had had conversations with Daniel while he floated along the ceiling. And that he, on one famous occasion, he went out the window in a house, in a room in a house, and came in another window. The same spirit energies that take over mediums' bodies can manipulate objects in the seance as well. And some, called apports, appear from out of thin air. Apports are gifts which come from the spirit realms. They're gifts brought into a seance by the spirit people which have been found elsewhere. And we have wonderful cases where um, crosses and um, statuettes and even live animals have been apported into a seance. In many of our cases, women are attacked physically, sexually, and semen is found around this woman. Where does it come from? It's an apport through teleportation. It's the same way that blood comes out of, say, uh, a plaster statue. The most astounding manifestation that might happen in a sitting with a physical medium is the appearance of a substance known as ectoplasm. All through the history of physical phenomena, it is alleged that this substance is exuded by a medium and it can take various forms, sometimes long, white, streamers, sometimes it takes the form of drape. The skeptic would say that it looks exactly like butter muslin, which has been swallowed and regurgitated by the medium. But the most extraordinary claim for ectoplasm is that it can form itself into materialized figures, recognizable faces of those who have died. This is a very rare phenomenon. But in Minnie Harrison's circle in the 1950s, spirits materialized every week, as her son Tom remembers. The spirit person actually impresses themselves into this mound of ectoplasm which is built in the room, and they then impress themselves into it. Again, they can't tell us how they do it, but it becomes a living person in a solid form, not a ghostly form, not an apparition, not a, uh, an hallucination, but a solid person in a physical form. And the spirit people regularly used to say to us, particularly Granny, can you see my face? Can you see me? Can you recognize me? But Minnie missed the reunions. She was in a deep trance and afterwards remembered nothing of the seances. So the circle asked the spirits to help them take infrared photographs. And Minnie was finally able to see what her talents had produced. Jim Macquarie claims to have produced ectoplasm, an experience he found both uncomfortable and rewarding. The, the only thing we've found um, to be a problem is in the early days when we um, were feeling sick. We almost want to retch into the room, um, but it doesn't happen to you. It is actually a, a solid energy at work, and the, the body has to compensate and cope with this new energy. But once we've done it and trusted in it, um, those discomforts go away. And the benefits of what occur in the seance really um, compensate for all of that. Producing demands enormous skill and energy from the medium and can be dangerous. A sudden interruption while materializing ectoplasm is thought to have caused the premature death of Helen Duncan. On one of her sittings, two police uh, came in, unbeknown to the organizers, and when there was a materialized person standing there, they grabbed at it and shone a bright light of a torch on it. The ectoplasm was as it, as it will do, and created a serious hemorrhage. Of course, she was taken to hospital, and about five weeks later, uh, she died, according to the uh, doctors, of pneumonia. But frankly, it was this shock from the ectoplasm 
that did cause her death. The police were intruding on Helen Duncan's seance because they were looking for evidence of fraud. The th theatrical nature of physical seances was a magnet for the skeptics and psychic investigators, and most mediums came under close scrutiny. Seances had become a form of entertainment, and mediums, particularly physical ones who could produce exciting phenomena, were in demand. There was money to be made, and many inferior mediums succumbed to the temptation of faking their effects. It's easy to tell who the cheats are. A physical seance will always begin with the temperature dropping dramatically, quite often followed by breezes. It's always preceded by this freezing cold atmosphere, and you can't fake that. Minnie Harrison's circle welcomed visitors, but drew the line at the intrusions of the investigators. We knew it was all genuine. Why shouldn't it be? Eight people sitting together. Who were we fooling? Who would we want to fool? Ourselves? What would be the purpose? Many mediums feel that much opposition comes from those who are in accept the implication of seances that the spirits of the dead live on are afraid to face this possibility and are reluctant to the unknown but perhaps they are right to be cautious many people are uncertain about the idea of talking to the dead they hesitate to meddle with unknown forces yet the majority of seances are safe positive experiences if you actually do look into the subject for yourself, you will find there's nothing frightening about it at all. That When people come back, they come back just as the ordinary people that they were, still very human. They come back because they love you, because they want to give help and comfort. People have got to get over this barrier of thinking about spirits in terms of ghosts and hauntings and, and being frightened by it. The perceived dangers of sitting in seance, I really think, are blown out of all proportion. The reality is that most of the people who talk about this are people who have no experience of the subject or indeed have a hidden agenda. But the reality is, like attracts like. And if you are a decent person, that's what you attract. And there are certain rules to be maintained in a physical seance, and that is always to open in prayer. Because you see, if people from the spirit world are prepared to come forward to give us direction when we're in need, or they'll come forward to heal us when we're sick, then why should we fear them? I don't fear my mother. She comes, I didn't fear her when she was here. She's hardly likely to turn into something nasty when she passes away. But other mediums regularly encounter dangerous spirits. Ed Warren, a demonologist, claims to have come across many in his work. I say, oh, ghosts won't hurt you. A ghost won't hurt you, but an evil spirit will, and a diabolical spirit will. A couple rented a home. One night, as they walked into the house, the house was hot. Everything was, was spoiled and refrigerated. The doors were open. There was a violent argument. With this, a shadow ghost, a dark black mass appeared. It hit that man so hard, it broke his uh, cheekbone, knocked his eye out, broke the teeth, and then picked him up and threw him right across the room. Now, if that is a ghost that can't hurt somebody, yes, people have been physically hurt, have actually been killed by spirits. Mediums are aware that seances can be dangerous, and most invoke the power of prayer to protect themselves and their sitters from the attention of evil spirits. Through the process of working professionally in this field for 25 years, I've learned how far I can or I can't go, and I'm well aware of when I stop those boundaries. I always open up to a seance uh, in all my sessions with a prayer to myself. When I'm working with a group, I often ask them if they wish to join in with it. When I am working with a group, I work primarily in a circle. That circle will be sealed with a prayer and ended with a prayer. No one is to break the circle while we are in session. But not all seances follow these simple rules. The Reverend Tom Willis is an Anglican minister trained in exorcism. He isn't interested in contacting the dead. 
His job is to use the power of Christianity to banish evil spirits. He's often called in when what began as a parlor game turns into a nightmare. I think everybody, including mediums and everyone else, uh, are in complete agreement that the Ouija board is particularly nasty. We don't know quite what we're playing with with the Ouija board, but they do open spiritual channels and you then get something coming down the channels and causing problems. Tom feels that there are good and bad spirits just as there are good and bad people in life and that incompetent or inexperienced mediums often fail to recognize the difference. The whole problem with seances is that you never know for absolute sure what you're in contact with. It may claim to be Great Uncle Charlie and feed you a lot of nice information about the family, but then you find having produced some nice, um, accurate information uh, that eventually it starts telling you some bad stuff and some stuff which is not true, which causes chaos. Reverend Willis knows there are powerful elements at work. He's had some frightening experiences himself. On one occasion, he was working with a family whose house had been virtually destroyed by poltergeist activity. I got the biggest electric shock I ever had in my life. Um, and the family say I crumpled, I, I shriveled, but what happened was my elbows shot together, my knees shot together, my head whiplash back as this powerful force went through me. And it hit, as I, as I crumpled, I saw the boy suddenly go, oof, a mother go, ooh. Uh, and we worked out later that having gone through me, it lost some force, hit the boy with quite a bit. A mother just felt it going through her. This spirit was successfully exorcised, which is usually the most effective way of dealing with troublesome spirits. Some mediums visualize exorcism as a way of persuading an unquiet spirit to seek a point of light, their link to the next stage of their spiritual journey. If, if a person is clearly identified as being quite evil, then I think it's a job for the exorcist. And one would normally do that by referring them to the light, point out to them that they're not bathed in a dark environment. If they look away from that, they will see a lighter environment. And historically, people are sent towards a bright light. And it seems that sitting in the light or standing in the light seems to be a highly intelligent spirit form waiting to take that person through. Sending a lost spirit from the darkness into the light was just what Tom and Anne were faced with as the seance at the George pub neared its dramatic conclusion. As Tom watched the young medium struggle against the spirit of Robert Clay, he felt himself come under attack. It was just like somebody was like trying to tear your back off. It hurt. And then Tom saw something which turned his butt cold. Before me, my very eyes, this young lad, his face actually transformed. He went dark, he went long, he went cold, and it was the same face that I'd seen standing above me. He said something like, uh, I can't handle this. And as he said, as he opened his mouth and spoke, his face just dissolved away back to being the young chap that had been sat there earlier. Then the medium's voices came back, the two ladies. The young medium boy changed back to being a young chap. And they told Robert Clay they wanted him to come towards the light. The wall just like disintegrated, if you will, and a, a swirl of, of cloud appeared. And from these two mediums, you saw the two small shadows just drift upwards. And finally, even the spirit of Robert Clay relented and passed over onto the other side. The tension was broken. They had survived the most terrifying half hour of their lives. The young man, when, when he finished, was, was completely drained. He said he was very frightened. It's extremely hard to contain this 
presence when she took on board. I only saw Robert Clare once. Again, after that, we'd finished it, and, and I saw this, this like, uh, once again, a blur. And I followed it round, and next minute, it was stood there, and uh, he just smiled, and then disappeared. You said he didn't feel evil, though, didn't you? No, he you? wasn't evil then. No, he, he smiled then, which was obviously the first time I'd ever seen him smile. Tom and Anne, like thousands of others who have attended seances, have had an experience which they will never forget. Unsettling to some, comforting to others, seances fulfill a deep human need to unravel the mystery of life after death. No one can explain what happens when a medium tunes into the world of the spirits. But seances are, for most of us, the best hope for discovering what lies beyond the grave. Speaking and communicating with the dead. Gosh, this is a topic that includes crystal balls. This is a topic a lot of people use tarot cards, pendulum, Ouija boards. And there's varying opinions. I found that that was a pretty neat little documentary. It's kind of uh, aged, if you will. We live in a world now to where people have a lot of gadgets they use for ghost hunting. And I wonder sometime if these ghost hunters, if you will, I wonder if they really know that what they are doing Is speaking with the dead or attempting to communicate with the dead. Do they really, really realize that? I don't know. But that is, in essence, that is in, in, in reality what they're doing when they're out in these abandoned buildings and they're out in a cemetery in the middle of the night and they're using these recorders and devices. And is anyone here? Can anyone hear me? It's no different than using a crystal ball. It's no different except yeah, they can record different things. Spirit box scans, a lot of different radio frequencies. And you're welcome, Tina Kane King. Um, so this has been a subject I've been interested in all my life. Um, I grew up in a very fundamentalist Christian religion. And... Um, Having done so, um, we, you know, you believe in, in spirits, you believe in um, um, demons, you believe in devils, you believe in angels, you believe in all these things. It's all part of a supernatural world. It's all part of the paranormal. We used to hear stories from the from the Christian environment, from the church environment of people that were rescued by an angel or they had gone to a flea market and purchased some item that ended up being haunted or attached by some evil spirit and they couldn't get rid of it. They would try to burn it. It wouldn't burn. They would throw it in the river and it would come back and all these kind of interesting stories. So I, I, I had this growing up and, and then throughout my life, my father being a pastor, there was a great, well, there was a lot of funerals. There was a lot of death. There was a lot of dying. So besides, there were very, really in my childhood, I don't remember very many weddings. I remember mostly sick people and dying and, and, and my father having to tend to the needs of these people like that. During university, I worked at a funeral home. So now I'm in later years. I've had a lifetime experience and a delving into different things. My family, I lost all my family by the time I was 50. And uh, that enhanced my desire to, can I, are they still there somewhere? 
can I find them? Can can I hear from them? Is there any any tool, anything I can do to reach out to my deceased loved ones? Like, where are they? Are they still around? Are they still somewhere? So now a, a lot of people would ask me, what after coming through this decades of uh, of the subject, what do I feel about ghosts? And I'll talk about this a minute. And I'm not trying to sell anyone on my idea of a ghost. Okay, let's make that clear. I've got my views, your views. It's just a sharing of views. So if you were asked, Kelsey, what's a ghost? I like to use an analogy of echoes. And that ghosts are really echoes. Shadowy forms that of, of someone that's now gone. So you're walking along, you're, you're taking a nature hike through the woods, through a canyon. You're walking down a road and you, you, you're in the middle of this canyon. And is this common? Uh, at least when we were younger, we were and we'd yell out of the canyon, hello, and we'd wait for return echo. But we never heard it. It's me. Gosh, the echo never came back. And finally, it's like, okay, I've got to go now. So for whatever reason, the echo never came back. But I'm standing in a huge canyon. Maybe the distance between me and where the echo is going to come from. Maybe, maybe that's it. It takes, let's say, the sound wave, it takes 24 hours for the sound wave to come back. And I, I can use another example of going out to space and how long it takes us to get an image from Mars and communication from Voyager 1 and those kind of things. Distance. It takes longer. So I've stood there in the canyon and I've yelled out, hello, it's me. Okay, I'm going to go now. But the distance in that canyon, the, the, where this echo has got to come from, I say it takes 24 hours to reach the canyon wall and to bounce back. So the next day, someone else is walking along that same road. And out of the air, from nowhere, they hear, hello. That person says, who is it? That girl replies, it's me. This person's stunned. They think they're communicating with a disembodied voice. I say, What's it like on the other side? Can you tell me about the meaning of life? And the voice says, I've got to go now. And this person goes through thinking they spoke with an intelligent entity when it was merely an echo. Maybe a ghost. There's like an echo. Some would say like energy, residual energy. Are ghosts real? Well, cartoons are real, but they're not real. You know, in a cartoon, Bugs Bunny's there. You recognize Bugs Bunny, see his pictures, not just Bugs Bunny. But there's not really a Bugs Bunny. <laughs> so, so are ghosts real? You, you, have a, you have a concept of a ghost. It's kind of like cause and effect. And we've all done this. You stand beside a lake or a body of water, and you, instead of skipping a stone, you just throw a stone into the water. It creates these ripples. The stone sinks to the bottom of this lake or a body of water. But the ripples continue after the stone is long gone. So that's one way to look at it. Can we then communicate with deceased people. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed that. I like that old documentary. It found uh, it entertaining. Like I said, it's very dated because 
the, the tools used today are a lot different than they were back then when that documentary was made. But um, one reason I like that is because to me that proves that really, truly no tools are needed. If you go back through history, we've got not too far from here over at Aniston is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Raymond Moody. And he's actually the one that coined the term NDE, near death experience. And he loved Greek mythology. He was also a physician. So he had learned of what was called a necromantium. And in, in brevity, they would go uh, way back centuries, actually thousands of years ago. They would go into a cave-like environment and there'd be a perfectly still body of water or lake. And they would gaze into that water in the darkness. There may be a little bit of ambient light, but it was pretty dark. They could barely see little reflections. They didn't look for themselves. They sat at an angle. They could look into this body of water. And when they begin to see images, they would go into this meditative state. They would think about somebody that passed or died, and they would begin to see, sometimes hear, images of what they believed were deceased people, spirits. Raymond Moody took that to a new level and created what he called the psychomantium, which is taking a, a mirror with the ambient light behind you, otherwise a darkened room where you're sitting and you're not looking directly in the mirror. The mirror is offset from you, so you're not seeing your own reflection. You're not seeing any movement. You just see a dark mirror. And the same process. But they would go through a certain setup, according to Raymond Moody's procedure, of uh, if somebody you you know you're you're grieving, and he did this for grief, uh, loss, and uh, to help people through the grieving process from loss of a loved one. And um, he would say, "Okay, find a picture or some belong to this person. Get your mind focused on this person before you go into psychomantium." Thirty minutes. 45 minutes average time, they would sit there and um, and have these experiences. Prior to Raymond Moody, as you watched that documentary, there were people that would uh, would do seances. And um, it's always that reaching out. What happens at death? Some people, that's the question is, I just want to know what happens. Do we go somewhere? Are we dead? What what takes place? That's the question that a lot of people won't answer. Other people is like, no, they're convinced that life goes on in another form. Your spirit leaves your body and you drift off to wherever. And it's a matter to them of comfort to communicate with a deceased one. I know they're out there. I just I want to hear from them. I want to know they're okay. They were blind. Can they see now? Can they, you know, they, they, they had lost a leg. Can, is that an issue? On the, what, you know, we, we, we say that they maintain their same personality, their same individuality in this other world, this other realm after death. But they don't maintain the same physical composition. In other words, if they had lost limbs, the limbs are restored in this afterlife. If they lost vision or hearing or, or whatever, that those things are restored in the afterlife. That's the general consensus, and that's what gives a lot of comfort to, um, to people that go through these things. So you ask me, you don't need... A crystal ball. These are tools. It's kind of like setting the stage. You don't need tear cards. It, 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 they're cards. You, you deal them, you shuffle them, you deal them, you lay them out in a certain pattern, and then you read the cards. There's the death card. There's um, the uh, magician card, and each one of them can lead to certain things and certain in other words, 
I can tell something about where you're going, I guess. So even though some seances might involve a tarot card, tarot cards are not really used for trying to communicate with the dead, unless you think that the dead is, is, is giving you ideas of where you need to go or what where you are in life. So where do we go with all this? Where have we come to? Where have we go? There have been a multitude of books, some debunked, in fact, of someone that's gone through a near-death experience. And they were a doctor or they were a child or whomever, and they died and they saw the light or all these things. There's abundance of those books. Um, then there's a, a, a lot of Christians who live in fear of this trying to communicate with the dead. There's this great fear with Ouija boards, and that was even touched on in the uh, documentary I just watched. These items, any of this stuff, I don't. I don't believe these have any anything to them except the power we give it. I think that we give power to this. I don't think these have any any built-in power. I think we provide the power to it. This, a crystal ball, we give the power to it. The Ouija board has no power. We empower it. Nothing has any power that we don't give to it. It's the same way in the old times. And if you'll notice when you watch that documentary, it wasn't always a formal setting that they set at a table and candles. And some of it was a very relaxed, just like a living room visit. Come in, sit down. Let's see if we can get any sense of the afterlife, of spirits. And for different people, it worked in different ways. Part of it is how badly you want to believe. Part of it is um, how tuned in you are to what you're trying to accomplish. <coughs> this is the portal right here. This is bald head. This is the crystal ball right here. This is the portal right here. And all these tools we empower, we give power to those tools. Of their own, they are of no power. I've had a lot of interesting experiences in my life. Uh, I was once part of a group called the Paranormal Clergy, and my phone number was given out all over the place, and I would get these very interesting phone calls of people that were being attacked by spirits, one lady, and if you followed me any length of time, you've heard me tell a story of the young singer-songwriter out of St. Louis who was having a relationship with the ghost of Freddie Mercury, the lead singer for Queen. And she was being attacked by the ghost of Janis Joplin and all these other things going on. There was another lady from Denver, Colorado, who claimed to be being married to JFK Jr. after his death. All these interesting things. I never gave much thought I knew about a succubus, incubus, and those kind of things. But these relationships, like what came to me a decade ago, really, roughly a decade ago, took, took it to a new level. And also, I was aware of, and then I started investigating, and I found myself fascinated with the spiritualist church movement. Uh, which they do kind of like gallery weed readings in their church. Their whole basis, they give little 30-minute sermonettes, sermons, if you will. I guess in church, the average sermon's 30, 40 minutes. And they do the same thing, a different speaker pretty much each week, and they give it a little motivational, encouraging little um, sermon. And then they will have a like a gallery reading. You got the congregants there and the congregation, they're sitting there and whomever's standing up. It's a well lit room. It's not dark. It's not spooky. It's not crystal balls. 
and they'll give a gallery reading. They will say that they are communicating with deceased loved ones. I've seen, I've seen a male figure from somebody over there. Has, has, has anybody lost a father, a grandfather, possibly even a husband? And I'm seeing a, a tightening of the chest and then a, a, a pain in the leg. Does that make any sense? Is that is that is that is that something that anyone is there a Bob? See, this is the way a gallery reading goes. You've got, and the more people you've got, the more effective such readings can be because you've got more people to draw from. And I'm not going to make any critical comments as to the reality of all this or whatever. I think that in the reality that if there's a certain amount of comfort that can be gained from any of this, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's sometimes it don't really matter whether it's real or not. I think what matters is, is what you can pull from it. I get, some people upset with me because I say the same thing about the Bible sometimes. I think I don't think it's that important. I don't think the, the issue is whether the stories are true or not. But I think what message do we get from that story is what's important. And I think it's the same thing of what we're dealing with in the world of communicating with the dead. I think that is the, the importance of all this is what message do we get? Do we get comfort from it? Do we get something beneficial from it? What does it do for us? I think that's the important thing. I think at the end of the day, that's, you know, there's a lot of people that's afraid. They're afraid of these things. They're afraid of this crystal ball, they're afraid of the Ouija board, they have this fear. If you go in with that fear, I think you got a problem from the start because I think that fear is what any negative energy, what any malevolent being is going to feed into is that fear. It's like a bully. If you are in a, a, a child in a schoolyard and, and a bully comes along to bully you, if they get a certain reaction from you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to encourage them to continue. They got what they wanted from you. They got that reaction. But if, you, if they didn't get that reaction from you, if you didn't show any concern about their bullying, if you just kind of shrugged it off, and, they're going to go somebody else because they didn't get what they wanted out of it. And I think it's no different than when we deal with the spirit world. I think that's the whole point is that if, 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 if these entities don't get what they're looking for, boo, and I didn't scare you, didn't react, then I'm not going to go boo again. <laughs> it's like, there's, I got nothing from it. I got no reaction. It's like what we used to call uh, the, the early morning uh, disc jockeys on radio during, during commutes to work. They call them shock jocks. You're after that reaction. It's like an a entertainer, a, uh, a performer on stage. If they don't get that reaction, then there you go. What's, what's the point? So, uh, uh, Tino, uh, I, okay, I, I, what, what I said about the Bible... I've spent, you know, my, my whole background, my, my, my PhDs in theology, I've really studied. I had a lot of questions, and the questions just built up in me over my lifetime. It's like, I won't 
to know to me is like it, you know this is what i'm being taught i want to know i want to dig i want to find out something and i, I just you know it's it's like you learn about the history of things and whatnot it's like yeah i think you know i like to say that people have emphasized jesus i'm not trying to turn this into a religious conversation even though it tinges on religion when we talk about afterlife and spirits and whatnot um and of course i was talking about the spiritualist church but I, I think the whole reality is is that um we miss a message because we worry about whether the stories were true or not and when you look at some of the stories presented in the bible you have to ask your I have to ask myself. Maybe you don't have to ask yourself. I have to ask myself, like, that really happened? <laughs> I'm not talking about somebody being cured of illness or Jesus turning water to wine. I'm talking about some of the other stories. You go back, this, and then the one I like to refer to a lot is, well, Abraham and Isaac. Did God really tell Abraham to take his son up to the side of a mountain and tie him up and raise a knife to him? That was the person epiphany I had as a child and that story came real to me it's like oh man that's horrible the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and turning a woman into a pillar of salt I had those, those things I had a problem with but then I was able to back up and say this is a story this is a book written by Jews it's written for Jews it's Jewish stories they had a way of conveying um messages through their stories and i think that's where us gentiles totally miss when we read that book is because we get too concerned i think that if if, if people quit trying to prove or disprove whether jesus is real or whether moses was real and those things and focused on messages from this what we learn from these stories i think it's be a lot more beneficial to everybody and probably a le lot less divisive as well but here we are, and, um, you know, I've, I've had my excursions into ghost hunting. I, I still go to, I just don't go to cemeteries at night. First of all, it hit me that I don't think that any spirit creatures, any afterlife ghosts or whatever you want to call them, I just don't believe that they're concerned about whether it's daylight or dark. I think we're doing that because of Hollywood to set the stage like this behind me here at sets the stage of the spooky factor. So I, I just don't think that it's on that level. I think that what we, we you know, I think that we can have these communes of, of communications in broad daylight. I think if there's any spirit, if there's anything out there to communicate with, I don't think you have to set the stage like that. I don't think you have to get the crystal ball out and you have to light the candle. I don't, I don't think that's necessary. I don't think you have to go to an abandoned building. I don't think you have to go to a graveyard. I don't think you have to go to a, uh, a mortuary or where somebody got killed. I think we do that to create this environment. Again, it's, I, I call it the Hollywood spooky factor. <laughs> so the question still remains after thousands of years is do what happens at death? Do we go on from a very strict biblical sense? And I'm, again, I'm not promoting the Bible. I'm not promoting Christianity, promoting anything. I'm just sharing ideas. And most people uh, in my part of the world are raised in Christianity. And that's the, that's the base of any faith they have in a God and so forth. So that question, what happens after death? Well, first of all, when people say, oh, your soul departs your body. And, you know, this is just a container for your soul. Well, that, that is not a biblical thing at all. If you're going to base your belief on what's in that book, the Bible, that's not the point. Because, put it this way, if you talk about 
the creation account, Genesis. And you dissect these things. Okay, what do I what do I believe? What 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 feeling sense do I get out of this from the holy book that I was raised on? So I'll tie this in also with abortions. Ah, that awful subject. Early on, in the earlier part of uh, Christianity, all the way through the earlier parts of the 20th century, Christians didn't have a problem with abortion. Abortion was no big thing, and that was based on the Genesis creation account. Abortion was not an issue. And it was because of the creation account, which the Bible says about the creation of man and God formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. When did man become a living soul? When he took his first breath, according to the creation account. So that did away with the argument as far as uh, religion was concerned. Christianity is like, well, life doesn't begin until you take your first breath. That's what the Bible says. So that, that, that was a subject that was of no issue. Um, the word soul, the animals are souls. You're a living soul. The Bible says a soul that sins in itself shall die. Uh, the soul is you. So that doesn't take away from the fact that the, the, the belief, if you will, that you, you could have a spirit. Okay. That there is some sense of you that continues on after your death. It's just technically wrong to call it a soul. Because that you are, this entire being that you are is a soul. Your dog is a living soul and the soul dies. So that kind of answers the question as to whether a soul departs your body or not. I know it's just a word, but it does make a difference, I think. Spirit is a different subject. Now, if we communicate with the dead. Some will say, oh, the Bible... Um, warns about communicating with the dead. Well, there's some scriptures that could certainly make you feel that way, even though the Bible does talk in other terms about communicating with the dead as well. I'm not going to quote all that right now. I'm going to make it a very simple analogy from the Bible about communicating with the dead. I'll ask any Christian when you talk about, oh no, you don't want to talk to the dead. Well, do you pray and talk to Jesus? Oh, yes, I pray and I talk to Jesus. Well, guess what? You're talking to the dead. Because the story goes, Jesus walked this earth, and he was killed. He was put to death. So you're technically talking to the dead when you talk to Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> it's just, he was human. He was killed. He's dead. You're talking to the dead. You're invoking the dead. And it's, you know, now, let's give something else to think about. And also, I want to know my, my partner, Kevin, who's usually on this with me. He it was a graduation tonight that he went to a family member. So he's not with me. So I had to come up with something that I want to talk about. I am going and I'm putting together and I'm waiting, as they say, for the spirit to move me. Um, I'm going to do a virtual seance. Post it here, you in the comfort of your home, and we're going to go through a seance together. So um, um, I'm, I'm working on that. This is kind of somewhat a lead into that. Um, so let's let's look at communicating with the dead at a little at, at another angle here, because a lot of people will. Uh, Again, the Ouija board. Oh, it brings evil in and whatnot. And I keep saying it's not the Ouija board. It's this. <laughs> this is the portal right here. I don't care if you use this as a tool. I could use my, I could use my red cup as a tool. If that's what I wanted to do, we empower these things. But here's the catch. How do you know a good spirit from a bad spirit? And I think this is where people really get really get lost because it's like, oh, I, I see it all the time. You watch some of the reality TV ghost story shows or some of the uh, ghost hunting groups on Facebook groups that sharing their live streams of them going through their little things in abandoned buildings or graveyards. 
uh, you, just the assumptions that are made kind of it blows my mind. It's the assumptions that are made. Now, here I am. I'm living flesh and blood. I'm in the same realm as you are. I'm not in a different realm. I don't think I'm a ghost. <laughs> I don't think that I'm, I don't think I'm dead. I don't believe it. But I can make claims and you would question me. Even though you can see me, I can say, my name is Bob Smith. Uh, con men do that all day long, don't they? Real flesh and blood humans. If you do, do you trust you go out and say, I want to buy me a used car. Do you just totally trust this guy that's standing there saying, hey, <laughs> you know, this, this car is for you. I mean, do, do you just automatically trust this guy? See, there's people that you won't trust, flesh and blood people, very real people that you can feel, you can touch, you can see them, you can hear them, you can communicate with them with great ease. You don't need to go into a trance or anything else. And they can con you. They can fool you. They can throw you off. And you don't think that a spirit, and I'm calling a spirit a ghost, a spirit in another realm, you don't think could do the same thing? You don't think that you could... Oh, yes, I want to talk to my grandmother. And you hear this communication. Oh, grandbaby, sweet little grandmotherly voice. And you just, oh, it's a grandmother. Are you so sure? <laughs> that was brought up in the documentary we just watched. Are you sure? So the, 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 the reality is, is what people think they know. Let's let's go back and talk about the tie us in with Jesus. We have this perception, we have this visual of what we have been trained to think that Jesus looked like. So much so do we have this image in our grain in our minds that people claim they say Jesus in windows and toast. It's like, hey, you know it's Jesus. Whoever saw Jesus, there's no physical description of Jesus. Michelangelo did a painting, but he never saw Jesus. You don't have a clue, but you're just assuming, oh, a near-death experience, for example. Oh, yes, I, I died on the operating table. I went through the light, and there was Jesus. I saw Jesus, and Jesus said, not your time yet. Are you sure that was Jesus? Oh, yes. Why? Because he said he was Jesus, because I felt like he was Jesus, because he looked like Jesus. How easily people will trust something like that. Well, they can't even trust the guy next door who's flesh and blood. If you see where I'm leading with this. So there, there, there's a lot to think about when you start dealing with these things. So I'm going to, and I'm, I'm working on this, and it's a mental preparation. I like to say that my spirit guides are leading me this way. And uh, so I'm we're, we're putting together this virtual seance. I want to be as, I want to have as great an impact on everybody that participates as possible. Uh, Tina Kane King has said, oh, I said I didn't have negative things from the board, but they will mess with you. Uh, as much as a lot of people will. Uh, heck, I was talking to someone after I was dead in a humorous way. Okay. Um, so, the, yeah, there's a lot to this. A lot of people uh, experience what they say communicating. Okay, Tina King. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so there's a lot to this. There's a lot to be gained. There's a lot to be learned. And um, and it, it's interesting, at the very least, an interesting experiment in, in our existence. And we all, I outlived my family. Um, the last of my family died before my, the day before my 50th birthday. And, and you do wonder, do they, are they watching out after me? Can I communicate with them? Can I hear from mom one last time? Just one last time. I want to hear mom say, I love you, son. We want that. It's 
it's, it's you know that's there's no doubt about it no i don't know exactly tina uh when i'm going to do this it's getting very close um the timing has got to be right and i feel like there's certain things you're just kind of led to you can call it a universal pull you can say your spirit guides are pulling you in a certain way be right you will have a warning um uh, and I, I am looking for feedback. If you have a suggestion on what day or evening of the week would be most appropriate to do this, I'm willing to uh, take that into consideration. Uh, if you think uh, yourself or anybody that's listening, uh, I would like feedback. Uh, should it be at Saturday at midnight? Should it be Sunday at noon? Whatever. And uh, so I want that feedback. If, if, any, if you can help, give me that feedback. Give me what you think. And if you can share this with as many people as you know and, and let me know. And, yes, follow my page. I assume you're also subscribed to the YouTube channel, Abdominal Alabama. And I'm excited about this. I got a lot of interesting things we're going to we're gonna experiment with. And you don't have to leave home. It's in the comfort of your home. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to do a few things in preparation as we get close. Um but they're not totally necessary. It just kind of enhances the the, the whole experience, if you will. Uh, if you have a lost loved one that you really, really would like to get some sense from, some communication from or whatever, um, I will tell you how to get your mind around that and the things you should do to build up to that point of the seance. So uh, help get the word out. That's number one. Help get the word out. Give me feedback. Uh, what day of the week, what time of the day that uh, everybody thinks it'd be best. I can do it anytime. There's very little time that I cannot set this up and do it. Uh, and as we pick a date and as we lead into this, I will be giving out information on the Facebook page as to things that you can do to make this experience even better for you. So, um, that's what I want to lead into. I'd like to, now we're into June. I'd like to do this sooner than later. And we are getting very close. So, um, yeah, I'm glad you asked. So let's, let's keep that up. I am going to cut this short tonight. I started this early. Um, okay. So you lost your best friend very abruptly in 2018 and you would love to hear from him. And let's, I want to know when we do this, I want to know, Share your experiences. Um, and let's hope, let's hope that uh, something good comes out of this. Uh, I have done, and I'm working on a book about overcoming, uh, you know, going through grief and loss and whatnot. And I started that book, especially this year, because of everything we're going through with this uh, uh, virus and the people that's losing their lives and, and so forth. And now we've got the riots and all this other stuff going on. There's a lot of loss of life and, and so forth. And, and grief doesn't happen just because of loss of life. Uh, grief happens from loss of job. Um, uh, uh, and also there's some grief going on here with Catherine. She's kept herself muted here all night, but uh, her husband, um, Total truck because of a deer right out in front of him on his way to work. And that's that's grief. That's that's you go through mourning and grief or something like that. It's trauma. So we go through different levels of that. But on our end, we are dealing specifically, of course, with um, what happens at death and what can we do uh, from that. So, okay, I'm going to um, I'm going to close this down. Uh, I've about rattled on as much as I can tonight. <laughs> Spread the word. I'll be putting out little video advertisement things on this subject uh, as far as the um, virtual um, the virtual seance is concerned. Thank you for joining in, Tina. I really appreciate you jumping in and everything that you can do to uh, to help get the word out on this. I want it to be fun. I want it to be an uh, experience we can learn from. I hope everybody has a good good evening. Thank you, uh, Tina, for hanging in there. And uh, well, 
Amazing? <laughs> I don't know. Crazy, maybe. Have a good night.